But I'm thrilled to be here with you. I'm thrilled to be here and to celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ right here at the United Baptist Church with you this morning. Thank you so much for choosing to make this your home today as we worship and celebrate the Lord Jesus together. And so last week, we began the first of our final two sermons from the book of 1 Peter. And during that time, we discovered that if we are to live in a right relationship in leadership and service, we must begin by shepherding the flock according to the Lord's instructions. Uh, it's not all about talent or skill or competency uh, as much as it is about character and motivation when it comes to shepherding God's flock. And yes, I shepherd the flock here as pastor, but each and every one of us are shepherds of others that we have influence with and influence in the life of, whether it's our children or our co-workers or our neighbors or our friends or our family. And so there is a way to do that that enables us to stay in right relationship with one another as we lead. But it's not all about the leader. And so today, as we continue our look at 1 Peter chapter 5, I want to look in verses 5 through 7. And I want us to conclude our instructions on living in right relationship and leadership and service by realizing that our charge is not only in leadership, but that our charge is also to serve the flock faithfully as well. Last week we looked at shepherding the flock. This week we're going to look at serving the flock. And so I want us today to discover just how we can live in right relationship as we serve the flock of God today. So if you will, I invite you to stand with me as we look at 1 Peter chapter 5. We're going to read verses 5 through 7 this morning. <laughs> and discover just how we can serve the flock and remain in right relationship today. And the word of the Lord says this. In the same way, you younger men be subject to the elders. And all of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that He may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your care on Him, because He cares about you. Let's pray. Yeah. Our Father, we thank You for today, and we thank You for the instruction of Your Word. Lord, whether we want to admit it or not, we're all servants. And we will spend much more time in service to others than we ever will in leadership. So I pray that we will hear from your word today. And that we will respond to your word faithfully this morning. And it's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. The underlying reality of the whole book of 1 Peter, and maybe even in this passage in particular, is that things change. Change is a natural part of life. And when you look at the original recipients of the letter of 1 Peter, the church in Turkey, change is almost overwhelming. In the midst of persecution, Roman Christians have fled from Rome. They had filled the churches in Turkey. And what had been just a few days, weeks, months before is now radically different. Roman Christians left behind businesses and they left behind homes and they left behind family. They left behind anything that resembled stability even to the point of the way they worshipped. Think about this, for many who served as leaders and elders within the Roman church, this new life might have been especially difficult. Think about the, the way we do things here at United. You know, we, we have kind of a system for how we function and do things. 
And I imagine tomorrow all of that was changed. Just that quickly, everything we had grown accustomed to and used to doing is now different. And that's how many of the leaders from the Roman church had to feel coming in to the church at Turkey. And to the leaders in the church at Turkey, you may have a guy who's been an elder for a week, now with a Roman Christian who was an elder for 20 years. <clears throat> sitting in the house church he's responsible for. You don't think that changes things? You don't think there's not a time where the guy may be thinking, you know what, I'm just not qualified to leave when that guy's sitting here. It's change that has brought about a radical discomfort, a lack of clarity, a struggle to the relationships. How are we supposed to get along? and go along with each other in the midst of all of this change. And it's against this backdrop that Peter gives these instructions. As these two distinctive Christian congregations blend together, they must remember one essential direction if they are going to live in right relationship with one another in their service. And they had best adopt two crucial attitudes that are going to help them suffer through. And guys, I'm going to tell you, we desperately need that one direction and those two attitudes in our life and in our church as well. This wasn't a spur-of-the-moment instruction that Peter gave to them and was a one-time only use. But rather, this right here, this right here will carry churches until Jesus comes back in right relationship with one another. And so maybe as we come to this last sermon from 1 Peter, we find what may be our most important directions from the Apostle for our lives today and each day as we go forward with one another. So as we look at the text, the essential direction for keeping us living in right relationship is this. We're all called to serve in submission. We're all called to serve in submission. We do not like that. So I'm going to read it right out of the Bible. Because I want to make sure we read it. In the same way, this means instructions for you younger men, be subject to the elders. Now, let me explain what this ain't. And then I'll explain what this is. What this is not is talking about age. It's not talking about age here. It's talking about family. See, Peter could have just as easily have written this, be in submission to those in authority over you. But he's already done that. He wrote about that when he talked about civil government. When he talked about your outside associations. He dealt with the idea of hierarchy and authority outside of the church. When we talk about it inside the church, we talk about it in terms of family. We don't have a hierarchy. We have a relationship, a family. And just like in any family, there are people in the family that play the role of grandpa or great-grandpa or dad. And it is from there that the patriarch of the family sits, the matriarch of the family sits, and if it weren't for them, there wouldn't be no family. Does that make sense? They are the elders. That's why they use that term in referencing the leadership within the church. Look, these guys are responsible for the care and upkeeping and development and forward movement of the family. And so we should be submissive to their leadership. We don't like to submit. We all want to be in charge and we all think that we're right and if we didn't think we were right, we'd change our opinion so we could be right. That's how we're wired. We feel this way. We think this way. Mixing in our American individualism where I can do it all on my own and it really takes a beating on community. It's really hard to build a relationship when nobody wants to take the seat of service Everybody wants to be in the driver's seat. 
I've seen those clown cars, and even when they shove 25 clowns in that car, they can't all sit in the driver's seat. It doesn't work that way. And so we're called to serve in submission. That's what we're called to do. In our church, the role of the elder is really fulfilled in a number of ways. Those who teach classes, those who serve as deacons, those who chair committees, those who lead ministries all fulfill aspects of the elder. They all fulfill parts of what Peter's calling them to. Ultimately, if you carry the responsibility for leading within the church, you are helping fulfill the role of the elder and those who are in service to you should serve in submission. So that doesn't mean sit there and take a beating because they're going to give one out or never say anything. But it does mean that the goal and the idea is to work together to accomplish the goal that has been set in front of us. We do not have to agree 100% on everything to be able to work together and accomplish a goal with one another. Can you believe there are times where people in our church do not agree with me? I know that comes as a shock to you guys. <laughs> this may come as a shock to you, but there are times where somebody's in charge of a ministry or a class or something like that, and I may not agree with them. But you know what? We continue to go forward with one another, working together in love and in submission to that leadership. Once I designate authority to a class, to a teacher over a class, it's not my place to come sit in that teacher's class and run them down in front of their, their students. That's not my place. They're leading that class. My responsibility is to submit and support that teacher and encourage them and help them and move them down the road wherever God is leading them to go. When we designate responsibility for a ministry, it's not my job to tell that person what a terrible, rotten, awful job they're doing and how they can't do it better and how I'm going to do it better than they are and they're just going to be a figurehead. It's not the way it works. We have to trust and we have to empower and we have to enable. And then I have to do my part to submit in leadership to their leadership as I help them do what they're wanting to do. Wayne will tell you, I don't come in and tell Wayne, Wayne, this is what you need to do with the choir every week. I don't do that. Why? Because I trust Wayne to lead. When I sing in the Christmas musical, if that happens, I don't stand up there and say, no, we need to do it this way, we need to do this, we need to do it this way. Wayne says, you sing that. I go, yes, sir. And I try to support him as best I can. <laughs> because that's the way it's supposed to work. We're supposed to submit to those that have been empowered and called to the leadership of the work. In our church, we lay this out in regards to the idea of accountability. Ultimately, God serves as the one who provides direction and will hold us all accountable for our leadership and our service. That's the top of the food chain, folks. Not me, not you, not the janitor. God. <coughs> then, we move down from that, and it is the people who will provide direction and leadership and hold me as pastor accountable for what we do. And then, from me, I will provide direction and leadership based on the guidance and direction and leadership I have been provided to those who serve in ministry and organizational <laughs> leadership. And I will hold them accountable for what they do with that direction and leadership. And then they take that guidance and direction and leadership and they provide that to our people. And as a people, we serve in submission together in fulfilling what we have been called and guided and directed and led to do. Now here's the fun thing. Everybody is a servant. Everyone, me, you, deacons, committee chair people, um, Sunday school teachers, everyone is a servant. And everyone also carries some responsibility 
to lead in the process. We're called to work together in submission as we pour in our gifts and our abilities and our talents and our time and our treasure. And as we serve within the church, the result should be a service that reflects submission to everyone who has been placed in authority above us in the work and the service we've been called to accomplish. Every church member is called to shepherd the flock. And every church member is called to serve the flock. And only as we embody the instructions that Peter offers here in 1 Peter chapter 5, are we really able to do that fully and faithfully? But you know what? We can do it all right. We can lead, striving for right relationship. We can serve in submission. And there's still going to be times where there's conflict and disagreement. Right? That happens. The, the, that's the reality of working together and having different views and different perspectives. And that's okay. That's why Peter offers two attitudes that everybody ought to operate under. Not just the leaders, not just the servers. Everybody should operate under these two attitudes. The first of these attitudes is found in verses 5 and 6 where Peter commands us to live in humility. Live in humility. It says, all of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God so that He may exalt you at the proper times. Humility should be a driving attitude that is radiating out of the life of believers. Whether you're the shepherding elder or the serving younger, you're called to live in humility with each other. And you know why? Because pride and arrogance have destroyed more churches than false teaching ever has. We get really worked up over false teaching and heresy, but here's the deal, folks. Arrogance and pride has killed more churches and ended more ministries than false teaching ever has. There's no room for pride and arrogance within the kingdom. You know why? Because pride and arrogance keeps us from leading and serving faithfully. It takes my wants, my desires, my opinions, my traditions, my way of doing things, and it makes that the standard by which everything else has to come to in order to be right. And here's this big shocker. You ain't Jesus. There's only one guy that has the right to claim to be the head of the church. You ain't him and I ain't either. And so my opinions and your thoughts and our traditions are not the standard by which everything else has to come to and to think and act and operate as though it were is nothing more than arrogance and pride that Peter says should be out the door. Humility says your need is greater than my want. Humility says your desire has a place at the table just like everyone else's as we work our way together to finding the proper solutions. Humility says that while we may disagree, we can still work together as friends. Humility says when we don't agree, we can still get along in spite of our disagreement. Look at what Peter says in, in verse 5. He quotes Proverbs chapter 3 here. He says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I want you to think about what that really says there. When we are filled with pride, it's not just that God withdraws from us. I think we think that. I think, you know, when we do wrong things, God withdraws back from us. No, that's not what it says. When we're filled with pride, it says God resists us. God literally takes action against us to prevent us from succeeding. Think about your church, your home, your workplace. And ask yourself,
yourself, if maybe you haven't been experiencing God's resistance in those places because of the pride that's in your heart. Think about that. You know, we like to blame the devil for our troubles. Maybe it ain't the devil. Maybe God is resisting us in an effort for us to leave our pride behind. You ever think about that? But think about the other thing. Says, but God gives grace to the humble. In other words, to the one who has humbled themselves, everything they need to accomplish what they've been called to, God provides. Think about that for a second. When God stops resisting and starts providing, could you have any lack? Could you lack anything if God is the one giving the provision? Think about what Paul writes in Romans chapter 8. If God did not withhold His own Son from us, what good thing would He withhold from us? When God is providing, because we are walking in humility, we have no lack for what He calls us to do and calls us to be. Think about your marriage. How different might your marriage be if you were not filled with pride and instead were filled with humility towards your spouse and towards your children? Think about the difference between God resisting you from having the marriage you're supposed to have and His effort to get you to abandon your pride and God providing you with what you need in order for you to get there. Pride kills. It murders your relationship with God and with others and I don't care how well you embody submission, if humility is not the attitude underneath of it, it's just a fresh coat of paint on an old rotten house. Have you ever seen that? Have you ever seen somebody, you know, they're trying to sell their house and they've got some, some place where the roof is leaking so they get some of that kills aerosol paint. They'll paint the ceiling with that stuff just to try to cover it long enough to get the house sold. But it hadn't really solved any problems. The attitude is what ultimately keeps us in right relationship and leadership and service. And humility must be that attitude. But it's not the only attitude. Peter gives us one more crucial attitude for leadership and service that keeps us in right relationship. And that's the attitude of faith. Look at what he says there in verse... Six, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that He may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your care on Him because He cares for you. Guys, there's going to be times where decisions are made that you're not going to agree with. I know that shocks you. If you've been here longer than three years, you've never seen us have to make a decision where people may not have agreed with one another. Look, man, when you make a decision, that's just the way it happens. Popularity is not leadership. Just go ahead and put that out there. Just because it's popular, don't make it right, and it doesn't mean you're leading anybody anywhere. If you want to make everybody happy, go sell ice cream. But here's the deal. We're not selling ice cream. We're not running popularity contests. We're striving to accomplish the work and mission God has called us to, and that's hard. And it requires hard decisions. And in those times where we don't agree, that's where faith steps in. And here's why. Ultimately, God is the chief shepherd. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And He will hold everyone accountable for the decisions they make and the actions they undertake. When we grumble and complain and backbite, all that is is lack of faith. It is a lack of trust in Jesus to be the head of His church. It's that simple. Look, we make decisions I don't always agree with. I'm yet to get mad enough to look at someone and say, you know what, you're just doing this all wrong and I don't like you anymore and I'm going home and I'm not coming back. Some of you are sitting there going, yeah, because then we wouldn't give you a paycheck. Well, that's true, but that's not why I wouldn't do it. 
Guys, there's going to be times where hard decisions have to be made. We simply have to trust that God is working in the leadership He has provided. And go forward together in humility knowing that God is more than able to take care of His church. So are we then just to, just to ignore it, sweep it under the rug and internalize it? No. First off, it says cast your cares upon the Lord. He cares for you. Take your concerns to Him and trust Him to deal with them and you as those things take place. But secondly, deal with things in a Christ-like way. The answer is not to complain and gossip and backbite and undermine and serve with lack of integrity. That's not what we're to do. You got a problem with something? Address it. Talk to the person. Discuss it. Pray with them over it. Work it out. And here's the deal. If you have an issue and a concern, they should be willing to work it out with you because the goal of everything like that is to reconcile with one another. That's the goal. That's what we're working towards. To walk in right relationship with each other. How many of you have ever had to come and talk to me about something you didn't like that I did? Oh, everybody has now turned paralyzed. Wayne raise his finger. Wayne knows. <laughs> Several of you. Have I ever started throwing stuff at you from my desk? From the chair. From the chair, okay. <laughs> no, I want to work things out. My desire is to work things out. I don't want us to be at odds with one another. I want us to work together with one another. But the only way that happens is if we deal with one another in the right way. And it's amazing how much grace God gives to us when we humble ourselves and come to one another in the right way, seeking reconciliation. What difference would it really make in your church, in your relationships, in your life, if humility and faith were the attitudes that were governing what you did and how you served? You know, it's not a pipe dream. Living in a right relationship with one another isn't some fictitious idea that's just out there. It's the command of God that He empowers and enables us to do. We've been encouraged to that point. That's what He wants us to do. And here's the deal. There's going to be this great day of judgment where the chief shepherd's going to come and he wants an account. And here's the thing. Baptism numbers are not the deciding factor in whether or not we were successful. That comes a shock. I love to baptize. I'm a numbers guy. That's not, that's not the deciding factor of success. Whether or not we had the biggest building or the most people here on Sundays or whether or not we taught the most Bible studies or, or whether or not we raised the most money, those are not the deciding factors of success and effectiveness in ministry. But whether or not we're living and walking in right relationship, and that's a crucial, crucial box on the evaluation form. That, that's, originally when I wrote this, I said that's the thing that God is looking for. I would say it is one of the most important things. How have we lived with one another? Are we living in right relationship with each other? Have we embodied the attitudes of humility and faith? And is it a demonstrable presence among us? That's the real question. Is that demonstrable in our life, in our families? at our workplace, in our neighborhoods, in our church. Is that what's there? Is that what people see? Is that what God is using? Maybe today the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart about that. Maybe you've been shying away from taking your place in Christ's service. And really you've just been running away from serving. 
You know, well, I'm scared. I'm nervous. I haven't done this in a long time. And maybe Christ is speaking to you and he's saying, Hey, man, it's time to get involved. It's time, it's time to take your place. I've called you to be a part of this church. It's time to take your place in the work. And if that's you and the Spirit speaking to your heart about that, then I would encourage you and invite you to respond this morning to that. But for some of you, maybe you've been taking your place, but you've been taking it with the wrong attitude. <clears throat> maybe you've been carrying around an attitude of grumbling and complaining versus humility and faith. <clears throat> maybe this morning the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart about making that right. Making it right between you and your Savior. Maybe you need to make it right between you and somebody else. Maybe you've had a confrontation with someone and the goal wasn't to be reconciled. And you need to make that right. And if that's the case, I would encourage you to do that today. Maybe you need to make things right between you and your Savior. Maybe you're here and you've never trusted in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation. And today the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart. You know that's what you need to do. If that's the case, I would invite you to respond this morning as well. But guys, here's the deal. In the book of Acts, chapter 3, verse 19, there's an event that's taking place. Peter is preaching the gospel in the temple, and he says these words that I believe are equally valid to the one wanting to trust Christ for the first time, or to the one that maybe has been wandering far afield and needs to make things right with Christ today and rededicate themselves, or to the one Christ is calling to take their place in His church. But it's Acts chapter 3, verse 19. And Peter basically calls for those who are truly seeking to worship God to repent and turn back so that their sins may be wiped out, that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Maybe today it's time for you to experience that season of refreshing. To follow God's instruction and service and leadership, to adopt those attitudes, to repent of our sin, to change, to turn and be changed by the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in obedience to our Savior. And to experience the seasons and the times of refreshing that only come from the Lord's presence. In just a moment, I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer. During that prayer, I'm going to make my way to the floor. Wayne's going to come back to the platform. At the end of that prayer, I'm going to be standing on the floor. Wayne's going to invite you to stand. He's going to call you to turn in your hymn books to the invitation hymn this morning. And as we begin to sing that song, if Christ is speaking to you today, then all you need to do is step into any one of these aisles and meet me right down front here. And as you come and share with me how the Holy Spirit's dealing with your heart, I'll pray with you here. We'll respond in whatever way is appropriate. But this morning, if Christ is calling you, He's inviting you to experience those times of refreshing that come only from His presence. As you become a part of God's family, trusting Him in salvation, as you make things right and rededicate yourself to the Lord Jesus, as you become a part of His church, the church He's called you to be a part of, as He brings change into your life, and as His kingdom is expanded in your submission and demonstrated through your humility and faith. If you will, I invite you to just bow your heads and close your eyes as we go to the Lord in prayer and begin this time of meditation. Our Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your grace and your mercy and your goodness. We thank you, Lord, that you have provided for us what we need. That you've given us instruction to serve in submission and to live in humility and faith with one another that we may walk in right relationships. And I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here that needs to respond to you today, that they would do so. That they would feel the pull of your Spirit upon their heart. And that they would be changed 
to experience the seasons of refreshing that come only from your presence. And it's in your <coughs> precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Stand up with me. your presence, God. God, I just ask that uh, you would let this message soak into our hearts and that we would um, humbly serve others, God. Uh, God, I just ask that you would be with us uh, throughout this week and uh, uh, just help us as we, uh, as, we, as we get to see a bunch of new people this week. In Jesus' name, amen.